truth. I'm 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 forbidden truth. I'm hard. Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. Today I'll be speaking with Frederick Michael Baer, who's serving two life sentences without the possibility of parole for the double murder of Corey Clark, 26 years old, and her daughter Jenna Clark, 4 years old. Frederick Baer was born October 19, 1971, which makes him a Libra. The Libra's motto is, nobody is an island. On the afternoon of February 25, 2004, Corey Clark and her daughter Jenna were alone in their home near Lapel, Indiana. Corey's seven-year-old daughter was in school and her husband was out of state. After Bear made his way into the residence to burglarize, he made eye contact with the homeowner and her daughter. He used the knife to slit the throat of Corey and attempted to rape her, then chased down Jenna and slit her throat. The day of the murders, Bear had been working his regular construction job. He left work, murdered Corey and Jenna, then returned to work to finish his shift that day. He was arrested less than a week later and charged with the murders of Corey and Jenna, among criminal confinement, robbery, burglary, rape, and two counts of criminal deviant conduct. Frederick Michael Bear was convicted on all counts and was sentenced to death on June 9, 2005. In 2018, his death sentence was overturned and he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Here's my interview with Indiana double murderer, Frederick Bear. Hello, this is a prepaid debit call from Michael Bear. An inmate at the Indiana Department of Corrections, Miami Correctional Facility. Let's start off with talking about your childhood. Where were you born? Well, I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana. But at an early age, at some point, we we lived in Indianapolis for a little while. But then my mom, Wanda, uh, met my dad, stepdad, David. And they got married, and we moved to Illinois, a little town called... Uh, Macon, Illinois, and we lived there in Macon, Illinois from about maybe 1975 to about maybe 1979 when my mom's dad, Papa, passed away, so we all relocated from Macon, Illinois to Indianapolis, Indiana, so my mom could be close to her mom, which is my mamaw, Peggy. And we lived in Indianapolis, Indiana, from 1978, well, about roughly 1978, 1979, all the way up till, you know, then on. We we lived in Indiana since then. Hmm. Do you remember your first positive memory as a child? Yeah, it, it would be over in Illinois. It would be when I had my uh. My first bike, when I got my training wheels off, but then when that was, there's so many good memories in Illinois, in Macon, but life, you know, kind of took a turn for the weird after we moved to Indianapolis, but my first good memory in Indianapolis was when I got my first big boy bike, and that was a red and white huppy uh, bicycle, no training wheels, big boy bike and everything, so. And I got it that winter. That was in 1981, I believe it is, when I got that bike. Mm -hmm. So that was my first positive good memory that I remember the most about of everything. What about your first negative memory as a child? My first what? Your first negative memory as a child. Oh, uh, that would be in Illinois. Uh, <laughs> I had a problem with uh, stealing cars, little matchbox cars, and, you know, so uh, my first negative memory would be when my dad made me sit the entire summer, my stepdad, David, he made me sit the entire summer at the kitchen table writing, I will not steal, I will keep my hands off other people's property, front and back on a college subject tablet and it was the first one was the first just a, like a one subject tablet but then it graduated to like the half inch thick five subject college tablets and I had to write that I sat there all summer practicing my handwriting and writing that out and he was teaching me a hard lesson like that 
I will not steal. I will keep my hands off other people's property. And I sat there literally all summer while everybody else was out playing and stuff. That was my first ugly memory as a kid. Did you suffer uh, any type of childhood abuse or trauma? Yeah, uh, in certain ways, mental, emotional, psychological, some physical abuse, yes. Uh, mainly for my stepdad. My mom was sort of, you know, an enabler to protect me. She was overly protective to the point of enabling uh, and allowing negative behavior. But uh, my dad, he was really an overbearing uh, disciplinary perfectionist perfectionist dips but disciplinary and I, I suffered a lot of crap from him the the mental emotional psychological crap but the physical as well later on in years you know and it wasn't good but I, I know I'm not the only kid who's ever had problems like that in life that's dealt with that you know I realized that later on but I felt really alone isolated uh, afraid you know walking on eggshells every time my dad come around or stuff like that. Did the law ever intervene or CPS? No. No, it was mainly just kept in-house. The law never came in. Uh, uh, child CPS or Child Protection Services never came in. Uh, it was never nothing like that. Nothing really violent uh, to where the law would intervene. Uh, I acted out negative behavior, you know, negative attention, and I also had a lot of uh, ADHD, uh, hyperactivity, uh, climbing the walls for, you know, because I was really high strung and highly energetic even as a kid. So mom and dad tried to help calm me down, take me to the nurse, to the doctors and stuff, and they put me on Ritalin, and I developed a sort of an addictive problem to that and I started like literally climbing the walls to try and get Ritalin you know and and, uh, and so my mom purposely uh, took me off that and basically weaned me off of it all together so that was about it really have you been diagnosed with any mental illnesses well uh, in later years I I was diagnosed with a lot of severe behavioral problems, uh, but as far as mental health il illnesses, I, I, um, I can't really say until after my death penalty when I was seeing psychiatrists and psychologists and doctors and stuff, I can't really, that's about the only time that I was really diagnosed with any kind of mental illnesses and stuff, but, you know, uh, there is a lot of doctor's reports in my death penalty trial that diagnosed me with uh, uh, certain uh, mental health issues not otherwise specified uh, uh, with Axis 1 and I think Axis 2 uh, but I am from my own understanding I am bipolar with mania so and that's about the only health, mental health issue that I have that I've really dealt with other than my hyperactivity and, and my, uh, you know, depression issues. That's just about it. What was your behavior like growing up, starting as early as you can remember? Energetic, happy, uh, always wanting to do something, really couldn't sit still. Uh, going, going, going. I mean, really high strung, energetic and stuff. They had a problem with, you know, I had a problem with uh, sitting still and stuff, and that bothered my dad a lot. And, you know, really upset him in a lot of levels because I wouldn't sit still, and that made him angry. Uh, yeah, just not really just wanting to sit still, just always wanting to do things and, and run around and, and stay busy. I hated sitting still. I hated being idle. And that led me to being get, sometimes getting in a lot of trouble sometimes too, you know. 
throwing plastic ducks in my neighbor's swimming pool <laughs> over in Illinois. You know, so I wanted to, I was a stupid little kid. I wanted to see them float. I always liked ducks and stuff. And they had these little plastic, uh, plaster of Paris cement uh, ducks or whatever outside their pool, above ground pool. And uh, I used to go over and throw them in, in the pool just to see them float. And, you know, they'd get upset and come over and tell my mom and dad, and that would upset my dad and stuff. But I, when, after we moved to Illinois, I got into a lot of trouble because of the fact there were so many opportunities to do so much more stupid stuff, uh, leaving people's gates open, playing with people's mailboxes, and uh, stealing candy from the store down on the corner, uh, hanging out at the pool hall, watching pool players there. Mom came down there a few times to get me out of there. But that, those sort of things. What was your behavior like in school, primarily in your middle school and high school years? Middle school and high school. Well, in middle school, uh, it was erratic that's really I should start off in, in fifth grade because after my sister passed away in 1983 uh, missed a lot of school a lot of problems I broke my ankle mom held me back in fifth grade because of the fact that I missed so much school because I was on crutches I couldn't get up and down the stairs so she held me back in fifth grade I repeated fifth grade for that um, I had a lot of uh, issues for my teachers. Uh, they, you know, had problems with me sitting still and and paying attention and being attentive to what they was talking about. I was a class clown, always goofing and being silly and stupid and dumb, you know, just to get a laugh. But when I went to junior high, that's when I think pretty much that's when the drugs started. You know, I started hanging around other kids and got introduced to uh, smoking cigarettes and actually uh, puffing paint and just being stupid and skipping school a little bit more and really not paying attention and having a reckless attitude. High school, I really started screwing around then, but in junior high, that's when I really started getting in trouble with the juvenile uh, detention center, juvenile hall. You mentioned starting drugs at an early age. What types of drugs were you doing? Well, I mainly marijuana when I was at an early age. Uh, when my sister passed away in 83, I smoked my first joint coming back from the graveyard. I thought it was a regular cigarette. Uh, it was with my sister Peggy and my brother Pete. They was dry, uh, in the front seat and I was in the back seat. And they lit up a cigarette. And they gave it to me, and I, that was the first time that I got high. And I went back and uh, went, went to bed. I slept. And uh, that was the first time that I'd gotten high. It was in 83. I was 11 years old, going on 12. Uh, but then yeah, I started, you know, stealing my old man's beers. I drink a beer every now and then. And... Uh, but, but then when I went to junior high, I really started smoking uh, weed, marijuana, a lot more, huffing paint, uh, started doing speed, uh, and uh, a little bit of cocaine. That was about it for then. I didn't graduate into the heavy stuff until years later when I got in my 20s and stuff, or, or, early or later teens. but. And that was when, uh, like, cocaine really got to being an issue. And all right, Mr. Watson, uh, this other things going on. I got drinking whiskey and dropping acid and things like that. Did a lot of cocaine, a lot methamphetamines. They came up later on in life. I really liked that, but you know that was really way powerful of a drug. So I've always had an addictive personality disorder. You know, it's like 
sitting there drawing. I'll sit there. I, I like to draw or drink coffee or I, I, I overindulge too much to uh, satisfy, you know, whatever it is, like overindulge period, like eating or drinking coffee or drugs and stuff. And so I've always had an addictive personality disorder. I do know that about myself. But that was about it for drugs. Besides the underage drinking and the drug use, did you engage in any type of criminal activity as a juvenile? Yes. Uh, that really started when, well, I mean, the very first time that I got caught stealing as a juvenile, I was with my mom over at Kmart, and I stole a ruler that had a calculator on it, and they caught me. And... Boy, I got my butt beat for that one. Dad went home and Dad beat my butt really bad. That was the first time that I actually got in trouble, first with the law. But then in junior high, I had a paper route, and I, me and my best friend Robbie was running around doing our paper route and stuff, and we used to stop at this candy store all the time. And uh, I always carried a knife on me. And I always had problems, you know, taking it out, flipping it, flipping my knife, and this, that, and the other. And, uh, well, my knife, I was in the candy store, and my knife fell out of my pocket. And I just picked it up, and I was just sitting there, standing there, flipping it, flipping it, flipping it. And I guess the old lady felt threatened or whatever, and she said something or whatever, and told me to get out or whatever. And I flipped it around and flipped it, my knife up in my hands a few times. Finally, I stuck it back in my back pocket and left. Well, I didn't know it, but she had apparently called the police. She felt threatened or whatever. Well, after Robbie and I got done with our paper route and I went home, uh, my mom told me that the police was there looking for me, and my dad uh, called the police on me. And uh, they pulled up and took me to juvenile. And that was the first time that I actually went to juvenile. And I was about, I was, I think I was in eighth, eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade. So that was my first time in juvenile. Then another time I was in uh, junior high, me and a friend of mine, Brian, uh, skipped school and we ended up going to a junkyard and bashed out a bunch of windows in the cars and stuff, old junk cars and stuff. And, uh, the attendants of the junkyard caught us, and they called the police, and we went back. To, I went back to juvenile again, and I got in trouble for that. I had to stay there for a little while. And that was basically the beginning of my, you know, criminal history. Juvenile, doing stupid stuff and stealing and reckless uh, behavior and things like that. What about as an adult prior to the cases that landed you in prison? Did you engage in any criminal activity prior to these two cases? Uh, yeah, I was, again, uh, in juvenile, uh, or not juvenile, but uh, junior high, and smoking a lot of weed and uh, going to, to a drug dealer named Richard, and uh won't put his, their last names or anything out there, but... Uh, he, I give him, uh, like $600 for a nosy, a dope weed, and he tried to rip me off, and so, uh, I broke into his house later on, you know, after he left, I was like, all right, so I went back and I went through his window and I broke into his house and stole his stash and I stole all his money and I stole his, uh, his CDs and stuff, but what really caught me is when I went to sell the CDs, at the place that I sold the CDs at, they had a camera, and then they, you know, put it together, and I got caught for that, I had to do some time, that was my first bit, and, you know, I got, uh, as an adult, really, actually, that was my first, uh, real prison bit, uh, but juvenile is just, uh, I, there was another time that was when I was living down south in Edinburgh. I stole seven checks 
from a great great uncle and I forged two of them and uh I ended up doing a little time out of that. Uh, the juveniles in Indianapolis, they try to do a uh, positive placement on me, like putting me into a community hospital type setting uh, and other kind of uh, placement, like Star Commonwealth in Ohio. Uh, I was there for a while, and for 18 months, but I successfully graduated from there. And I, this was all as a juvenile before I turned 18. And after I graduated from Star Commonwealth, I was living with a lady, the foster mom, foster parenting, because they took me out of my mom and dad's custody, made me the ward, a ward of the state. And I stayed there with a, an adopted lady, a lady who adopted me, or actually my foster mom. Her name was Judy, and she was young, first time being a foster parent. And I lived there with her, and I was like 17 years old. and actually 16 going on 17 and I stayed there for the longest time and to and going to uh, high school uh, I went to three different high schools Manual High School uh, Perry Meridian High School and then my last high school I went to was a uh, 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 Washington High School and that's when I was living with Judy my foster mom and Ran up my stepbrother and we started getting high, huffing white out. And uh, she found out about it and noticed my behavior had changed and stuff. And, you know, and just started, uh, you know, really being weird towards me. And finally, uh, that it, it didn't work out between Judy and I. And she basically kicked me out. She took me to the hospital and dropped me off. And that was it. And I stayed with uh, uh, a guy named Bill Rogers, which is deceased now, which was one of my mom's ex-husbands. And I called him dad, and he was, you know, he loved me as a son, and he's just a good person, a good human being. And and I lived there with him and his wife, Dodie. I lived there for the longest time, and they basically emancipated me when I was 17 years old, because I was almost 18. This was after I left from Judy, and I tried to go in the Army. And uh, uh, 17 going on 18, and I went to re the recruiters downtown Indianapolis to try and join the Army, and they uh, I passed everything um, as far as my written exam out of a class of, like, I think it was 100. I was in the top 10% with a written exam, high scores. Then when I got down to my physical, I flunked that because of a medical issue, and so two weeks later, I caught my first adult felony, and that was the burglary from Richard. That That's when it was, and that was my first adult felony, and, that, uh, and I ruined my middle, military career and all that. So, so they, did, they didn't charge me as a juvenile. They charged me as an adult from the burglary from Richard, and... They give me, uh, I think it was 18 months, uh, DOC, three years, do 18 months, and I had a year wrapped up in a county jail, and I did like six or seven months in DOC, and I got out in 91, I believe it was, so I got locked up in 90, then I got out in like 91, something like that, out of prison. DOC first time offense in prison and I did I lived with my mom for a while and I got married in 1991 September that's my first wife September 27th 1991 I got married I kind of went a little off question there sorry let's talk about the crimes that you were originally sentenced to death for can you walk me through the events that led up to the crimes that occurred on February 25th, 2004? Okay. Well, I had just gotten out of prison this last time, which was my fourth time being in prison. And uh, I was doing pretty good. I was had home monitoring and everything, and uh, I just completed a drug class at CIC. They're in Pendleton, Indiana. 
and they told me that I could get out early since I completed this drug class. And I'm like, okay. So they signed paperwork and everything, and I was approved. And I went to a work release center. And the work release center told me that I could, uh, if I could find a job and a place to live, they could let me be released from work release on a home monitoring, ankle monitoring. And so I told mom and dad about that. Told mom, and mom said, well, here's the deal that me and your dad said that we'll find you a place to live. You find a job, we'll pay your rent, you pay us back until you get up on your feet. And everything was great. And I did that, and I successfully completed my home monitoring. But at the time that I'd been introduced to my third wife, Tina, which I barely knew, but she was a friend of my second wife, Zola. And uh, Tina and I hooked up, and slowly but surely, you know, I was doing great at my job. I was a, a, a welder working in a, a, a muffler shop, and I learned how to do brakes. I learned how to run uh put up mufflers and bend pipes and stuff and all that and I was doing great and the I just got my job and the, the boss gave me uh you know saw I was a good worker good with customers and stuff and everything was great uh, but then here come Tina you know and slowly but surely here come the pot here come pills a little bit of cocaine some crack then that Thanksgiving after we had gotten married Thanksgiving of 2003, uh, methamphetamine got introduced back into my life, and it went downhill from there. I lost my job, uh, got fired from there because I was screwing up at work, and started doing a bunch of crimes, you know, burglaries and stuff like that, and uh, running around at night stealing, trying to support my habit, and shoplifting, and just doing stupid stuff. And uh, I just had a, uh, and I don't care attitude. It just like I I I self defeatist and I lost faith in myself. I lost faith in in a lot of things, and I just felt like I'd lost in life because I got back on the dope and lost my job and I lost my dad again. And so you know, I just it's like a spiraling downhill effect, and. I hooked up with some buddies of mine who uh, used to be incarcerated with, and they got me a job as a traffic controlman, a flagman at this tra construction company. And uh, I basically was doing good and everything, and but I was still doing dope and doing drugs, and I still had a uh, attitude of hopelessness and corruption on my mind and spiraling out of control and I committed some crimes. I I, I raped a lady in uh, up in Noblesville, which is Hamilton County, and uh, at, while I, you know, after I got off the job and everything, and I went back later on and a uh, couple weeks later and I raped her at home. Then I was relocated again in another place in Anderson, Lapel, Indiana, and uh, I had uh, left the job site. I was high and everything, and I looking for more dope, looking for money and drugs and stuff, trying to find some uh, some place to break into to find some money, get some stuff to make get some money. My main goal was to get money either to steal some stuff or to get some stuff to get money to buy dope. That was my main goal. And uh, that's when I saw uh, the lady, some lady pull her trash out to the to the street. And I'm like, okay, she looks like she's getting ready to leave. And, and so I, I went down to another house and I, Basically, I was knocking on doors, and if nobody answered, I'd break in their house and, you know, go in and bur burglarize them. And I knocked on one lady's door, and she came to the door. I asked to use her phone, and, and then some other, some dog came up, and it really freaked me out. And I, uh, I, I lied to her to use the phone, and I don't re really remember a lot, because like I said, I was withdrawing, and I was spun out of control.
wasn't in the right thinking in the right frame of mind I don't really remember a lot about certain specific events with that but after I left that house I went back to where I saw my lady pulling the trash out and uh, I basically did the same thing I went up and knocked on the door and I a little girl come to the door and um, I asked her if I could use phones I just my, that was my thing I, I, I was dressed up in a construction vest and uh, I asked to use the phone. I, I lied to him, saying that I was lost. I was looking for my job site, you know, not really intending to do any harm or do anything like that. Uh, but then it was like uh, she went and got the phone and uh, left and left me there at the front door. And I already saw the lady there and everything. and. I'm thinking, okay, I, and honestly, shamefully, I say this, honestly, uh, I, I'd i raped that one lady in Noblesville, or I'd already raped her, uh, a lady named Crystal, and, and uh, I uh, figured I'd try and rape this lady also, and so I went in and, uh, I took. I basically took the phone in, and I was going to get the phone to her, either put it down on her table, or I tried to get the phone to her. I can't really clearly remember, but I remember her in the bathroom, towel on, and everything, and and uh, she started freaking out, and I freaked out, and uh, very hypervigilant, very uh, reckless and out of control, stupid, not thinking. I grabbed her and pulled her into uh, an adjoining room off the bathroom and I attempted to rape her. And uh, the, the little girl was trying to get in the door and everything, which uh, I, I, I tried to block the door and hold this lady at night point and you know, it just, I couldn't so I told her to told the girl to go away and everything and so she said go back to your room and uh, again I, I don't remember a lot as the events that took place was really fast paced and everything and I do remember trying to to get aroused but I, I couldn't and I was heart pumping adrenaline pumping head spun out of control and uh the next thing I remember was her on her knees and I had cut in her throat. I had cut her throat. And uh, I just, I really wasn't, it was like I was detached away from myself, watching myself do this in like an outer body experience or something stupid that I just wasn't thinking clearly. And I was just totally really out of control. And uh, I walked out the door of that room and I i don't know why but the little girl was running away from the door and I grabbed her and I cut her throat also and uh, I don't know how long it was that I was standing there in the room or in, in the living room where, where it was at but it just it felt like I was there for the longest time and it I was right there face to face with evil, with ungodliness, because I felt the presence of death and I felt the presence of evil. And I experienced some things that I can't really physically put words to. And I know what it was. I, I was face to face with evil, with ungodliness, and a very benevolent evil presence. And uh, it was. Uh, I, in my faith I have now in, in the Lord I know it was Satan himself and I was in the middle of hell because I heard yelling and screaming I, I basically had a, a complete meltdown breakdown and uh, I, I remember leaving the house and getting in my car and driving around 
man, I don't re- really remember so much of, of what I all I did after the fact, but I got back to the job site, and I remember uh, the flagman asking me something, or the other, the construction workers asking me something, and I don't really remember, but then I heard the sirens. Everything went completely quiet, like everything was just quiet. And I heard the sirens from a lot of vehicles, and I knew in my gut that was for me. That, that was they had found the, found out what I had done. The detectives and other people was combing the entire neighborhoods all around, and uh, they come up. Some uh, the police crews would come up and ask there at the site, and if they seen anything suspicious and. I guess the construction people said no and all that. And uh, well, after job, after the job, the day was done and, and everybody was leaving the construction site. I left and I was heading back home and I gotten lost going back home to Indianapolis. And uh, I got in there late that evening, about 7.30 or 8 or somewhere through there, I think. Uh, my third wife, Tina, was up. She was angry at me because I didn't call or whatever. And uh, it was, uh, all I remember that night was just lying in bed crying. I cried all night. And uh, uh, I, I, I knew I'd, I'd lost my life. I'd lost my soul that night. I'd lost my par- part of me. And I knew I'd really gone too far and I'd done something that I couldn't undo or take back, uh, like with the rapes and stuff. But I'd real, I realized that I'd really gone too far when I took those two lives. But it, it didn't really hit me until like days later. I was just, I was sick. I was lost and I was scared. Uh, the next day, uh, my wife, Tina, and her mom had to go down south for some kind of operation for uh, Tina's grandmother or whatever, and I had the plans to leave, so I went over to my sister's house, and uh, I packed up, and I was going to go on the run, because I knew that it would be a matter of time. I just knew, and uh, uh, basically, I was over at my sister's house, and I went over there, and she had asked me what I'd done or, or what's going on. And I said, I, I, I just can't talk about it. She said, what what happened? Are you okay? I was like, I just can't talk about it. Just turn on the news. You'll figure it out. And she turned on the news and it came on the news what had happened to uh, Corey and Jenna, uh, the late the people that I had murdered in Anderson. And I said, I did that. And she said, she couldn't believe it. She's like, no, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. And about that time, my phone started ringing, and it was the detectives investigating that case. And uh, they basically called the construction, or went to the construction site, and they apparently told them that their flagman didn't show up, so they got the name of the construction site owner, or the flagman, and uh, they called the flagman and the, the main branch of and they found out that I was the one that was appointed to that construction site, got my name, my phone number, my information, and started calling me that way. And apparently they bounced signals off the towers or cell towers or whatever to, to relocate or to locate my exact coordinates or whatever. And they was asking me if I could come in, and I was like, well, yeah, I've got some things to do. I tried playing a game with it, playing a game with them, and I, I knew that was, you know, wrong and but I was scared and I didn't I knew I just knew in my gut and so I uh, tried to put it off put it off and then the next few minutes later on I said I'd be in there tomorrow and uh, then about maybe 15 20 minutes later they called back it's like well you know maybe we can come to you and this that and the other and and uh, they basically they was just on the second phone call, I knew in my gut that they had me. 
And so I just basically stayed on the phones and let them let let them to me. You know, uh, and sure enough, they, I don't know, a couple hours, about three hours later, uh, my cell phone had died. They had a, a uh, description of my car, so when they found out the coordinates or the location about where the cell signals was coming from, they, I guess, coordinated the whole area, quarantined it off or, you know, blocked it off. And, and uh, my sister went down to get my charger out of the phone, and they saw her going to that car that they had a description of, and they followed her back, and they'd come to the door after she went, came get back in, knocked on the door, and when they knocked on the door, I just knew that's what it was all about. And when she opened up the door, here come like a whole bunch of officers. Uh, at first, I thought I'd run out the back door, and I saw them there, so I started to run out the front, and they put me there on the front, on the ground in her living room hallway on my stomach and put a gun to my head and said, if you, if you move, just shoot, uh, we'll kill you. I said, just go ahead and kill me. It would be easier. And uh, they arrested me. They took me back to my apartment where I was living at, Indianapolis. Uh, went through all my stuff, collected all my property, my my clothes and things like that, and took me to Anderson Jail and they put me in. And they put me in the padded cell. And the next day, uh, the detectives was talking to me, trying to interrogate me. And at first I tried to lie and use, uh, play the innocent role. I don't know what you're talking about, it wasn't me. I wouldn't do that. Then I tried to play the media. You know, I tried to lie. And finally, I just come clean, you know, to the detectives. And I, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm done. I, I know you guys that know it was me. So I went ahead and told them the truth. I said, this is what I'll do. And I said, this is what I'm asking for. And I asked them to give me something to eat, something uh, to drink and a cassette tapes and a tape player. And I'd make a full, complete uh, cleanup statement and give them some stuff that they didn't know nothing about. So they gave me something to eat and they uh, gave me something to drink and they, they brought the tapes in, the tape player. And so basically I just told them everything that I best that I could that as I remembered it, how I did it and what I did. And then I went on to make some cleanup statements about the rapes that I had done in Indianapolis and in uh, Noblesville about Crystal and the others that I'd, I'd heard. And uh, they didn't have anything on me about that. I, I told them the truth about it, and I just let them know. And I confessed to that, and I owned up every bit of what I did. So after that, that began the, the process of the other police agencies coming to do their investigation work and uh, charge me and, and hold me accountable for the things that I've done in Marion County and, and in Noblesville, or Hamilton County, to Crystal and the other two in Indianapolis. And uh, it was just a matter of formality of them doing their legal work and, and doing their police processing and things. and. Uh, they did this rape kits on me and I, I basically told the truth. I, I owned everything that I had done to Crystal and, and, and the other two. And uh, they kept me there in Marion County Jail for safekeeping during my death penalty trial because I, my life was in harm's way and jeopardy when I was there in Anderson. Uh, because of being a high profile case and I killed a woman and a child. And, and, and other stuff. And so they was taking me back and forth from Indianapolis to Anderson during my trial in 2004 and 2005. And uh, my lawyers and stuff was coming there to the jail, interviewing me and, and questioning me and, and doing their thing. And basically I, I tried to, you know, just waive my appeals. They tried to find me guilty, but with mental illness, I was seeing psychiatrists and stuff. They tried to find me guilty, but with mentally ill, being mentally ill, but that wouldn't, the prosecution wouldn't have nothing to do with that. Uh, and so they basically just found me guilty, period. 
they charged me with seven different crimes and they sentenced me, they used all seven of the crimes, the charges to find me guilty in the jury and they convicted me of the two murders, the two deaths and they gave me the death penalty and that was in June of 2000, uh, June 20, June of 2005 when they found me guilty and sentenced me to death uh, for the murders. And so June 25th, 2005, I went up to, I left Anderson Jail and I went to Indiana State Prison on death row. June 25th, 2005, I went, up, went to death row at the Indiana State Prison. And uh, I was there going through the formality of my appeals and throughout the years there, I tried three different times to waive my appeals. I was there when minutes after Frederick Bear was sentenced, he unleashed a profane rant on the way back to jail. He was sentenced to death for the February 2004 murder of Corey Clark and her daughter Jenna and LaPell. Prosecutor Rodney Cummings. If we don't impose a death sentence in this case, then I don't know who's out there that we should ever impose it on. I'm not certain I've seen a more deserving defendant than this individual. Before the murders, Beer had already been a one-man crime spree in central Indiana. He's been convicted on a number of other cases, home invasion rapes in Marion County and Hamilton County in addition to this crime. So he's probably, I, I think the outdate is he'll be 81 when he's done with those crimes. So uh, he's never getting out of prison. But is it the will of the murder victim's family that Bear pay the ultimate price? They're ready to get this behind him. So if we, I feel confident that given the facts of this case, there's there's likely to be another death sentence imp imposed, but then you're looking at another 15 years appeal for them. Do they want to endure that? And I don't want to put them through that if they really don't want to do that. Many potential death penalty cases nowadays are being resolved with sentences of life without the possibility of parole. Backing up a little bit, a local news station had reported that you went on a rant just minutes before being sentenced in court. Do you remember what all you had said before you were sentenced? Not really. I really don't remember too much because, uh, honestly, I was still had methamphetamine. I was withdrawing and detoxing from the chemicals and stuff. But yet, when they did the toxicology, on my blood, my blood work and stuff. They said that they couldn't find no methamphetamine in my system or all this. There was a big to do about that. And but I know what I've done and everything. It's just I'm not sure. But no, I don't remember the ranting and the raving of what I was saying or anything. Uh, Channel six or eight or, or I know it's of local news stations, but I'm not sure what all I'd said. How did you feel after you were handed down your death sentences? Lower than stale shit, excuse my language, uh, humiliated, ashamed, uh, disgusting, facing the reality of having to look at myself and live with myself for having done what I've done to three ladies and, and a woman and a child, and uh, having to live with what I've done, you know, I, I felt uh, disgusting. I, well, honestly, I felt worth, worthless and worthless, worth, worth, worthless and like a waste. I mean, I can't find the right words to say exactly how I feel because it's pretty small and pretty low. Like I said, the best analogy that I could say is that uh, snail shit has a higher opinion than what I had of myself. While you were on death row, was there anybody executed prior to your sentence being commuted? Uh, yes. There had been like uh, four executions, four or five executions. The first one being Kevin Connors. The second one being uh, a guy named Matheny. Uh, uh, let's see. There was another execution... And then there was uh, Eric Wrinkles was the last execution, and that was in 2010. And I got to say, uh, Kevin Connors and, and 
Eric Wrinkles, especially Eric Wrinkles, I, I give. Uh, he's just a great guy. He was a good human being. He, he had a lot of remorse. There was a guy named Michael Lambert. There was a, uh, he was uh, 18 when he got arrested, and he was like 41 or 42 when he got executed, something around that age. And uh, he was drunk, handcuffed, and that man was should have never been executed. That was a wrong execution. His appeal should have won uh, by all the mit- uh, mitigating facts and all the, uh, the merit in his case to... Uh, this should have exonerated him and got him off death row, at least life without parole. But Michael Amber, uh, although he did kill an officer, he should have, by all rights and judicial and constitutional rules, he should have never been executed. He was unjustly executed. And uh, there's a few others. But the last execution was uh, Eric Wrinkles, and I can't say enough good things about that man. He was... Even though he and I got in a fight about something, where you know we clashed, uh, like oil and water about some things, we resolved our issues. We was men, and we made amends with one another, and we did our best to live and get along with each other. I ended up doing some artwork for his daughter and for his son, which later on was broadcasted across the MSNBC lockup, and it was two framed hankies that I'd done, one for his daughter and one for his son. Uh, with cross and scroll because that's what I do I draw on handkerchiefs and I used to build frames for them and he was the last execution that was in May of, or that was in yeah May of 2010 but again I can't say enough good things about Mr. Wrinkles he was a good person uh, he had a good heart a good spirit and he had a lot of remorse and, and he had a lot of love for a lot of people and he did a lot of good things for a lot of people a lot of good human beings you know, even for the other death row prisoners that was up there. I mean, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't, they wouldn't have had a four hours recreation. And because we was only getting one hour of recreation when I first got up there, then it was like two hours. Then finally, because of Eric Wrinkles, we ended up getting four hours recreation. So Indiana State Prison death row is locked down 20 hours a day, but it's getting four hours recreation. And there's some really good guys. I'm not going to lie to you, uh, Mr. Dodge. Uh, me and the guys up on death row, uh, although we didn't get along, we had there was a lot of clashing, a lot of character conflicts going back and forth, personality uh, uh, conflicts back and forth. There was a lot of good guys up there with a lot of good skills, a lot of talent, a lot of knowledge and intelligence. But... There's also a lot of uh, selfishness and a lot of uh, backbiting and, and, you know, things like that. Although we didn't get along for the majority of the part, I won't speak ill of Benjamin Ritchie, Michael Dean Overstreet, or Jeff Weissike, or Roy Ward, or Joseph Corcoran. Although there is a lot of bad bitterness and a lot of bad blood because of certain things, I won't speak ill of their character. I just hope to God that maybe they might come to an understanding of something outside themselves and uh, choose to change. Hmm. I mean, I think the, the death penalty is barbaric, especially in the modern day age of our country, of the United States of America, the most well advanced of all the nations is the United States of America, the land of opportunity, the, the land of, of growth and progress and humanity with so many uh, equal opportunities for or, for equality and stuff and, and so much more, but yet it's, it's still yet practicing the barbaric dark ages of cruel and unusual torture of eye for an eye, murder for murder, when there's nothing that's good or valid that comes from murdering people. There's nothing good from coming from uh, executions. Nobody wins. The, 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 the murderers on death row, uh, the people who's been murdered, the, the families 
of the victims and the people on death row, not only in Indiana, but in the United States of America and other places, nobody wins. It's just an eye for an eye. And in all rights, Jesus Christ said, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, but I say turn the other cheek, forgive. You know, and it takes a bigger, better nation and a bigger, better people to forgive and stand up and do what's right to forgive and, and to sanction that behavior in a, in a better way other than murder for murder. Because nothing good comes from doing the same crime. You know, I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get even. Nothing good comes from that except for more negativity and more destruction. And, you know, as, as advanced as the United States of America is, still practicing dark age barbiturate, bar, bar, barbaric acts of cruelty and, and brutalism towards human beings. Human beings that uh, has a, a chance to change if given the right setting and the right circumstance and the right environment, you know. A lot of innocent people have been executed, but yet later on exonerated. And, 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 and not only that, I, I'm so strong against the death penalty period as a whole in any form because of the fact of, of the lethal injection is not 100% because it's still, you know, even the uh, uh, other countries have stopped selling the, the, the drug that kills people. So, you know, because they, they realize that it's so barbaric. And, you know, now there's, there's so many botched executions and then there's so many people that's been innocent, that's been proven and exonerated. So when you were on death row and an execution would take place, what was the uh, what was the policy for not only the inmates but the staff that day from morning up until nighttime? Well, usually uh, the policy and procedure of an upcoming execution would be like uh, they would move the. Uh, the death row prisoner up to the first cell, which would be uh, like 201, or no, excuse me, 103, or it's the first cell closest to the guard station on the flag, and they would sit there uh, and be watched and observed for like three days or four days after his appeals come through and uh, the, the execution order will come he would be moved and relocated to that cell so he could be watched and observed by the staff. Um, the day of the execution, they would, like, two days, the day before the execution, they would remove that prisoner to the, uh, the like, the major's office, which is, back then, uh, it was the execution chamber. It was over the major's office. But since then, it's been, that building has been condemned and a new execution chamber has been built up at the uh, Indiana State Prison. Uh, but they would lock everything down. Usually, the whole prison would be locked down for like two days. Uh, the prisoner would, being executed, would you know have his last meal and everything, visit with family, if any kind of family and friends would visit with him make phone calls and, and, you know, tie up this, you know, final final goodbyes. And uh, he would then later on that night would be executed. Uh, the whole atmosphere would be quiet, tense, uh, stressful, uh, stark reality of where we was at. A lot of times for me, it was uh, remembering what I'd done. Uh, it was, uh, I know there's some other guys up there had known people longer than I had. And, you know, so it, the loss for their friend, like uh, Michael Lambert, uh, Kevin Connors, uh, Eric Wrinkles, those three guys, you know, there was a memorial wall of everybody that was sick executed, their name and everything would be up on the wall, memorial wall, you know, but those guys was really admired and liked and, it, you know, uh, done a lot of good things and helped a lot of people. So when those men got executed, it was really heavy back there with the, uh, the other inmates as well as the staff and certain other inmates over in ISO house because a lot of people on death row was up there for a long time. 
and uh, so it, they really their presence was greatly known and then greatly missed and uh, even after the fact and I said Rink, Eric Wrinkles was uh, a big patriarch of doing a lot of good things not only for the staff but also for the inmates and bringing a lot of health and strength and positivity and constructiveness to the whole well-being of the prison system because the prisoners used to be held at it, the maximum supermax confinement in, in Westfield, MCC. And if it wasn't for Eric Wrinkles, John Matthew Stevenson, who also got off death row, and uh, Michael Lambert, those three men, uh, along with the help of some Catholic priests who petitioned uh, the Indiana Supreme Court to get those guys moved out of Supermax MCC back to the Indiana State Prison. The main help came from Eric Wrinkles and John Matthew Stevenson and uh, Michael Dean over, or uh, uh, Michael Lambert. And those guys really helped out a lot along with the help of uh, a couple of Catholic priests who went in behalf to the Indiana Supreme Court on, on the behalf of the death row inmates to get us moved back there and uh, to have a little bit more humanity because it, being there in, in the Supermax was, uh, he was locked down 23 and a half hours a day. He only had a half hour recreation time. Then other times you was locked in your cell and it was cold and, uh, and a lot of other things. So those three men on death row really did a lot to help. And uh, they was moved back to the Indiana State Prison, but the staff and administration and the inmates really had a lot of uh, stress and tension when the executions come up, especially when Eric Grinkles came to be executed, because he was uh, uh, a patriarch, well-known figure with the staff and inmates, and he did a lot of good with a lot of people. You know, it, like I said, it, it, it was a sad day that day, and it was he felt his loss. He, even after the fact, after he had been uh, murdered and executed, he still felt that you know the stress and attention. But hmm. it changes people. It change being on death row changes people mentally, emotionally, psychologically, socially, physically. It, it alters your perception about people, places, and things, and life in general past, present, and future. Because you're sitting there on death row watching your family, your people that you care about and love, and people that care about you and love you pass away. There's nothing that you can do about it. You're able to have animals. You're, you're able to adopt a cat. You know, I had my own cat for 13 and a half years. And Michael Dean Overstreet, Ben Ritchie, uh, Paul McManus. There's a few guys up there that had, had the cat program that we could adopt cats. You know, so there was like six or seven cats up there to, that it was adopted. That helped. You know, they tried to help people on death row to, you know, feel human and to relax. We got Xboxes and things like that to, 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 to pass time to keep our minds off things. And the men that's up there right now, I, I, I mean, like I said, there's been bad blood shared between them and I, but if this is publicly on record, I, I want to speak honestly to you, Mr. Dodge, that, uh, I want to make it official. I did this with Cairo's brothers, but I'll, I'll make it official now to apologize to Benjamin Ritchie and Michael Dean Overstreet and Jeff Weissach and Roy Ward and uh, Joseph Corcoran, Paul McManus and John Stevens, people that I offended and disrespected when I, when I was up there, we argued like cats and dogs that I was nasty and foul and disgusting to. And I, 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 I want to say that I apologize to them for disrespecting them and offending them as I know I did and for uh, saying some of the things that I've said. Right or wrong, it doesn't matter. What's done is done. I can't take it back. But I want to, again, uh, publicly apologize to them. You know, like me and Dean Overstreet did one time, and it kind of backfired. But I, I especially want to apologize to the people that I hurt and offended while they were on death row. And that 
would be some of the staff also, you know, because I had anger issues and stuff, cussing them out and going through problems with prison politics because of my crimes and stuff. And, you know, and I was wrong. I, I admit the wrongs that I did. And I can't undo it and I can't take it back, but I'm not that person. By the grace of God himself, Jehovah helped me to be a better person. And he forgave me and he gave me another understanding of love and truth. And it's by God's grace, because of his love and his mercy and his forgiveness, that he has given me a second chance to get off death row. He allowed the, the people that I murdered, their family, to forgive me by giving me an approval to, to take life without parole. You know, they didn't have to. The Clark family didn't have to do that. Is that how that came about? Is that how you got off death row? Was the victim's family primarily responsible? Or was it that plus legal maneuvers? It was the legal maneuvers first, but it, it's a divine act of God himself working through uh, legal matters of the world. Uh, the United States Supreme Court overturned my uh, sentencing conviction because of the fact of uh, prosecution misconduct and, and ineffective assistance of counsel during the trial itself. And so the United States Supreme Court kicked the sentence, uh, adjudicated the, uh, the sentence itself, set it aside, and had, had me go back to the uh, court, the district court, to be resentenced again. And due to prison politics of crap going on between me and the other inmates, um, I, I, I got a new set of lawyers, and I, I begged my lawyers to go to the prosecutor and ask the Tell the, telling the prosecutor that if they would just get me off death row, I would, you know, if the family would let me have life without parole, if they would accept me with life without parole, you know, I'm offering that. I brought the offer to my lawyers, and my lawyers took it to uh, uh, the victim's fam the prosecutor, and the prosecutor took it to the surviving victim's family. And the surviving victim's family uh, told the prosecutor, sure. And they would give me life without parole. And so the prosecutors told my lawyers and, and the lawyers took me back to Anderson Jail in Anderson, Indiana in June, or in July. And I sat there and that was like a mini vacation just to get off death row because of the fact of all the, the bullyism and the psychotic crap that I was going through, you know, stuff that I can't, com can't explain. Uh, so it's just so, any chance of me having a term of years or anything, I, I just basically forfeited. And I took life without parole, and I asked for that. And that's what was given to me. August 1st, uh, 2019, the, the surviving family, the husband, the, uh, the, the three people of the surviving family got up on the stand and said their piece and, and said that they agreed to give me life without parole. And then the judge himself said, uh, directly asked me, he's like, Mr. Barry, do you know that at any time during the course of this questioning, there's uh, testifying, if they had any problem with this life without parole, that would have been set aside and we'd have proceeded on with a death sentence. I said, yes, sir. And I, I publicly apologized on record to them again. And uh, August 1st, uh, 2019, they gave me uh, life without parole twice, and uh, I uh, was removed from court and was taken back up to the Indiana State Prison, and I sat there for 19 days. And August 19th of 2019, I walked up, I walked off death row with uh, two life without parole sentences, and I went through. Uh, uh, RDC in Plainfield, Indiana for 37 days and then I came here to the Miami Correctional Facility in Bunker Hill, Indiana where I've been for the last two years since September 24th of 2019 I've been here at Miami Correctional Facility and since then I've <laughs> oh, highs and lows I've been attacked a couple times I almost died I've been extorted uh, I've went through hell in high water <laughs> uh, is that I, is that I'm due to your is that due to your crimes? Yes, due to my crimes, my past. Uh, people found out why I was here and stuff, and 
and uh, I, you know, was extorted by a racist group for a while, and I asked for help, never got no help. I was attacked a couple times by some people and almost killed. Uh, by the grace of God, I walked through uh, four men who had knives, and by all rights, I should have been dead. And they didn't, they didn't, I wasn't stabbed up or anything. And um, that got squashed off by somebody else, by the grace of God. Uh, I've been lied on, I've been falsely accused since I've been here, and I've been proven not guilty about that. And now, again, uh, by the grace of God, for someone like me, a horrible person that I was in my past, and, and you know, uh, I have a job. I work at ICI Garment Shop, and I live in honor dorm because I've kept a clear conduct report, and I've did my best to stay out of trouble. I try to stay with the Bible and walk as a good human being with my faith, and I try to share love and hope and truth and peace of God's love through Christ Jesus with people. Not ever. I don't. I don't walk a perfect walk. I don't talk a perfect talk. I'm not a perfect human. But I do have faith in Jesus Christ, and I have his love inside of me, and I have his truth. And I try and share that with people to help them find hope in him, like he gave to me. Because I know, I know for a fact, if God loves me enough to forgive me and to give me a second chance, working through so many different ways, means, and resources, I know that other people here who have an outdate, they have a hope, too. And there's a lot of hopelessness here in this facility. But I know if they just have faith in him, that he can help. But nobody's perfect, you know. Mm-hmm. We're all human, and we all fall short, and we're all screwed up. But he loves us. I do know that. I know that for a fact. He loves us. Right. He helped me understand his love. And, I, and it's without a doubt, Jehovah loves me with, with everything that I've never known of what love is. And I've tried to help people understand that love. And I thank my friends and the people that's been in my life on the past that's helped me be there, you know, to help me stay strong. I've had friends, pen pals in my past in Finland, Australia, Switzerland, uh, Sweden, you know, United States, Great Britain, you know, throughout the world, you know, some really pe- really good, sweet people to come to visit me, Tammy, uh, a lady down in Georgia named Annalisa, some people, some really good-hearted people come at the time of their life to write me letters to give me support. They didn't have to. I'm not angry at them. I just, you know, I'm grateful and thank God that they played all, they all played a part with helping me become the person that I am. You know, because it took a lot of bad heart adversities to help me change. And that sometimes bad things do happen to good people. Not saying that I'm a good person, but I'm saying that sometimes bad things happen to good people because of God's divine love to help us to, to change. You know, sometimes we don't listen. And there's a lot of innocent people that's living here. You know, I believe in my heart and my spirit that, you know, that he has allowed certain things to happen in our lives to put us here to get us to force our attention to him to set us down, to, to redirect, to refocus, to, to so we can hear his voice, to what he has to say to us. I truly believe that, Mr. Dodge. Same way with Annalisa and Tammy, Caroline and Crystal, uh, Dawn and Billy, and Peter and Nellie, and the rest of the people that's there. Uh, for the things that I've said and done, I hope that you're able to somehow forgive me, but I don't wish no ill in nobody's life, and I pray to God that you guys are doing okay and that you're maintaining peace and quiet and calm and your sobriety and staying safe above and first and foremost above all so and I thank you Mr. Dodge for you know giving me the benefit of and, and the chance to have my voice spoken out like this that was my interview with Frederick Bear be sure to head on over to unforbiddentruth.com to keep up to date on everything Unforbidden Truth related thank you for listening Unforbidden Truth. I'm 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 Truth.